Welcome back to Anderson's TV. We are in Los Angeles, um, and this is our. This is actually the first day that we've been here on our trip to the NAMM show, mm -hmm. and the lovely guys at Schecter invited us up to, to see their shop. Um, and look, they, they surprised us with some special guests. So Aaron Marshall from uh, Intervals is here. Um, we're gonna be talking about some of his new guitars and just, I don't know, life, the universe, and everything, right? Amazing, let's do so it. So have you flown down from Toronto just for the NAMM show? Uh, yeah, actually more so to do some secret things with Schechter. Oh. Uh, Nam, Nam is a, I'm, we're supplementing the, the Schechter appearance with, with Nam. But um, yeah, uh, we've got plenty of new things as you can see. So um, busy year and we, we want to make some videos and tell everybody about all this stuff. So that's what I'm here for. And then yeah, we'll do a little Nam, well, Nam that, appearance. That's cool. Look, we, we've never met, but it's great to meet you. Likewise. I've kind of got into some of that more, um, contemporary kind of you know metal styles that you know we met so oh, i met john brown last year yep. so and again sort of i think interesting to see rabir was probably my first sort of uh entry point into some of that but then i i see the sort of monuments the interval kind of stuff is, is is a different kind of vibe again but how did what were your influences how did you kind of get drawn into that style of music yeah so um intervals kind of happened around the time that actually John would have been sort of starting out with the Monument mm. stuff. In fact, he probably would have been doing his, his old band fell silent. So this is yeah. pre test reactive monuments and all that stuff. Um, I was uh, just graduating high school and I actually worked um, at a musical instrument retail store in, in Toronto called Steve's Music, which is like a cool. brick and mortar yeah. kind of situation. And I was just starting to figure out how to make music myself with guitars and a laptop and I had a little pod bean and you know that's kind of like the humble beginnings um you know funny you mentioned brown like that's a, a guy in the early days that i certainly looked up to and uh had made some friends with um uh the likes of you know misha and matt from periphery and stuff so like you know intervals sort of just rode in a little bit on the wave kind of behind like the front runners and what you would consider to be modern progressive metal and gent and stuff like that um and found sort of you know, my own way. Um, started off with, with two seminal instrumental releases. Um, that was me just kind of like finding the sound a little bit. There's an album in 2014 where we explored having a vocalist. These were the really early days. Mm -hmm. And then since late 2015, um, with the release of an album called The Shape of Color, um, was sort of the beginning of me just really kind of sinking into what feels really honest for me and in the context of intervals, which is producing um, you know, modern instrumental guitar centric music. So, yeah. Tell us about your guitar journey then, you know, what, when, you know, what did you start on? And, and, and I suppose ultimately we're sort of leading up to the, this, you know, finding your home at Schecter. But, mm -hmm. you know, tell us, you know, what, what have you played over the years? Yeah, quite a few things. Um, I've always uh, had a proclivity towards a variety of instruments. I just love guitar. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my, my first electric guitar was like a made in Mexico Fender Strat in, in uh, what they refer to as midnight blue, which is which is more in Pete's lane, is more the purple hmm. thing. You yeah. know? So they're lying when they when they use the word blue. Um, but I still have it. Um, cool. It's at, at my parents' place. I see it all the time. My dad will mess around with it. It's a bit of an iconic guitar for, for us. It's like humble beginnings. I used to play everything from like Green Day and Nirvana and Blink One Eighty Two, and then didn't understand anything about tuning your string gauge and would just be like, oh, I'm going to like learn a Slipknot song and tune my purple Strat down, you know, like, <laughs> so did everything with that. And then my second electric guitar, uh, which was kind of like, oh, now I have a big boy guitar was, uh, was an SG standard. Okay. And, um, I, I, I attended a, an arts based, um, and music theater sort of centric high school. And, um, the first sort of crack that I got to, you know, step outside of being part of the ensemble and doing something on my own was, you know, they, the teachers and the faculty had, had discovered, oh, we need a guitar player. And I put my hand up one time in an assembly like, oh, I play guitar. Um, and I got to do, uh, I get to lead a large ensemble version of Bohemian Rhapsody. So couldn't do it with a purple strat. So we so we got the SG standard. School of Rock was like a just thing about, at the it's time. It's got a School of Rock vibe to this, hasn't it? It so, absolutely does. Brilliant. So that's kind of like where that started, and I I learned you know everything I know between 
between both of those things, which is interesting because anatomically they're too mm -hmm. sort of like, you know, you have your, your American thing and well, and your other American thing, I guess. Right. Um, but, uh, I, I sort of discovered from that what I like about guitars. Mm -hmm. And then when I had the opportunity to start playing some things that maybe suit the vibe a little bit more, um, you know, there were some, some JPs in the early days, really wow. liked those guitars, still very fond of those guitars. I got to um, teach and perform as an instructor at John, uh, the JP universe just this past summer, which was really amazing. And it was cool to like, you know, be, be in his midst and had to share that with him and yeah. stuff, you know, really, really important. Um, and that's a guitar that's kind of like a Swiss Army mm. knife, so to speak. So I, I, I discovered that I, I like guitars that do a lot, streamlined, but do a lot. So, you know, there, there's a bunch of other things over, over the course of time. Um, really, the, 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 the thing for me with, with intervals is I've always just played what I'm drawn to. And it took a while to find a home with a brand that, um, like, genuinely believes in what it is that I'm doing and gave me some, you know, some slack on that rope to say, you know, if you're going to build one or if you could, what would it be like? Well, let's, let's talk, because I'm, I'm interested in that sort of, you know, Strat SGs, many of those guitars, you know, haven't changed a great deal since the 1950s and sure. 1960s. It's true. Whereas, of course, musically, you know, the, 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 there was nothing like what you were playing you know, back then. Sure. So tell me again, at, at a feature level or a vibe level, what is it that you feel that you need to overcome on a Fender or a, or a Gibson to enable you to play um, how you play? Interesting. Yeah, so the Strat is the closest thing to something that I could, you know, pick off a hook or pick mm -hmm. up at someone's house or it, even out of my own collection that would be more in the traditional or classic guitar sort of world uh, from an anatomy standpoint, just because there's no, there's no neck pitch. That's a really important thing. This was what sort of, I didn't know enough in the early days to understand why I like playing the Strat more than the SG, but I like the sound and the attitude of the SG, but there's something that I'm always fighting. And I didn't realize that there's a geometry there. Unless you study the, the anatomy of a guitar, you don't really know what's happening. So for me, like, there's a, there's a lot I really like about something from the, the Gibson-y world, but um, with music that moves sort of as quicker, is, is as demanding at times as, as what we do, an instrument that, you know, is almost as flat and straight as possible to a degree uh, is something that makes me feel comfortable. Um, as you can see, like, a lot of what I'm into is sort of like a modern approximation of that. Yeah. Um, but I still love a Strat and I still have plenty of things that are S-type in my collection that I, that I uh, adore. In fact, I have a few Schecter Custom Shop Strats that, that scratch that itch for me. Um, but uh, the prerequisites for, for an instrument that satisfy my needs would be you know, something that's rel relatively flat. So fingerboard radius plays a role there. When, you, when, when I'm thinking about things to overcome, as you said, with a Strat, oftentimes it's that like nine and a quarter thing or maybe you you play one that's you know got that compound feel or vibe to it or whatever, but that doesn't always necessarily get there. I think that there's there's some fight in an instrument that that's as round as that. So you know you get into this world. My Diamond Series instruments are 12 to 16 compound, and on the USA guitars I've opted for 16 flat overall. Just um, you know just kind of developing and refining mm -hmm. my taste as I go. But that would be the, the the thing that when I think Strat, I think fingerboard radius, and when I think like a Gibson guitar, I think about that neck angle. Mm -hmm. So those are the things to sort of overcome and in a, in a, you know, ideal modern super strat type of thing, you have a guitar that, yeah, is playing effortlessly. That is like, for me, an approximation of a modern strat bolt on something that, you know, from a tonal standpoint that mm -hmm. I really like. Um, and having a five-way switch in the place that I in the, in the area that I believe it belongs, yeah. you know, this is a little funky and that works great for some guys, but you know, this makes sense to me. Yeah. All of this just kind of feels like where I sort of started to a degree, yeah. you know, so. I noticed there's a, I mean, we'll talk about the differences sure. between the Diamond and the USA series, yeah. but the, the Diamond one is the one that's kind of out right now, yeah. right? So we'll, let's, we'll start with this. Yep. So again, had you had Schecter's before, um, doing this and, and has this been like an evolution of those Schecters or was this like a ground up thing for you? Definitely ground up. So it was early 2021 um, when um, 
um, Adam here at Schechter had, had reached out to me and um, it was kind of like, I almost didn't necessarily even really see, it didn't register to me like I'm being sort of um, uh, invited to make a signature instrument. It was almost like a project. It was almost like homework to me. It was like, here's a set of limitations. Let's build something that, um, like if you could have all of the specs that you want under, you know, uh, sort of one umbrella, so to speak, within this set amount of parameters to make an instrument that does the thing that you like, but that you know would be readily available at a fair price point mm -hmm. and around the globe off hooks whenever you want them. Like, what would that be like? So I came with some specs and I was like, oh, we can't, you know, with certain things. I'm like, okay, so it's a learning experience. Um, and, and really this is, so this is the second iteration um, you know, your viewers might be familiar with the instrument that we put out. It would have been late 2021 or beginning of 2022, uh, which features um, a darker fingerboard, an ebony fingerboard, and a wenga neck, and all that stuff. Different colors, etc. This is just happens to be the newer iteration. But the uh, those parameters were: let's use a pre-existing body shape, and um, I have a hard time some because I like variety. I have a hard time deciding sometimes about what it is that I like. So to me, the carved top super strat mm -hmm. type thing made sense because it embodies the aspects that I do love about, you know, some viewers would know me from the days where I, I, I tend to play PRS quite a bit mm -hmm. and things of that nature. So having that carve top element to it made, it kind of made sense to me. It's like, you know, I can't really decide. So let's have that feature. Uh, but the silhouette is the thing that, you know, that speaks to me the most. Um, and then from there it was like, okay, well, let's not get too crazy with materials. The idea about doing wenge on the first ones was to have something that kind of registers as exotic, but mm -hmm. these days it's readily available and it's quite a reliable um, material to produce guitars with. So I was like, well, that sounds cool to me because like a carve top, super strat, wenge neck, I don't think that really exists, so let's try it. Um, and, you know, from there, the, the non-negotiables for me were, let's use you know, let's use the, the, the highest quality hardware that we can get away with. Yeah. Um, and I understand that there's some considerations on this one when, when you're pricing an instrument that's inclusive for everybody. Um, I'm a firm believer that the contact points on the instrument are, are what matter mm -hmm. a lot. Um, so my favorite, when it comes to trems, I like a two-point non-locking vintage style type thing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, this company starts with a G, but others produce them as well. Um, so really like that, that makes sense um, to me. Um, the other thing as well would be the tuners. So we're, this guitar is featuring real hip shot tuners, which is excellent for a mm. guitar in this sort of part yeah. of the corner of the universe, so to speak. Um, and then we took some risks and played with a few things like the reverse headstock and yeah, the top back and things so like that. The head, reverse headstock and angled back as opposed to the, yes. you know, the sort of the, the flatter. And is that just, again, was that, because that made sense from a price point of view or was that, or I don't know, was that just, you just said, that's what I want? Or? So again, a lot of this has been an exercise in me learning mm -hmm. about, um, you know, I'm, I'm a guitar enthusiast, have been my whole life, I finally had an opportunity to get on this side of things and you learn as you go. So um, the, the tilt back reverse headstock speaks to me from an aesthetic standpoint. There's a compromise there though, which is the way they're produced, the amount of material that's discarded to create this, right. um, sort of swayed us away from being able to do quarter on one piece necks. Yeah. So what you wind up with is a really stable neck that features carbon fiber reinforcement. Anyhow, these things hold up, you know, people have seen me tour with them, um, you know, for a number of years now. No issues there, of course. Uh, but when it came to the USA guitars, and we'll get there, um, a one piece quarter saw neck was really important. So that's just a scarf joint then, is it? Or um, no, headstock. not a scarf joint. No, oh, it okay. just happens to be, it's just a, it's just a, like a multi lamb, like a three piece neck. It doesn't look that way. Um, Cause aesthetically it's important to, you know, to have that, yeah, yeah. that, that look and that feel. I'm not a big fan of, of stringers and seeing all that stuff. I, I, I kind of like things to be streamlined and minimal. Mm -hmm. As you can see, that's sort of a theme here, like, Minimal materials, monochromatic finishes. Yeah. I think it's just a nice place to start. You know, the plan is to iterate. So you, I like to start with something pure and, I, and then I can see us going forward from there. But it's just about nailing the silhouette. So that was sort of the ethos there. This guitar f features a, a roasted maple neck and fingerboard, just a little bit of a different flip. But the, the body is um, basswood um, on these and the USA guitars feature a, a lightweight alder body. Um, 
would have done alder here as well. Weight is a consideration, and yeah. I want these things to feel really balanced and light on the strap. No so. back plate. Uh, no, that's that's just today. Oh, you've taken that off. <laughs> I thought I thought you'd gone all John Mayer on us or something. Like uh, that. No, so um, no, but at times that's funny. <laughs> uh, at, at, at times I'm I'm tempted to um, to do something like uh, we have so many tunings, a uh, tremolo no or something would be good. Yeah, so, you know, nobody sees this anyway. Yeah, take your back plate off, whatever. Um, but that actually, I'm glad you said that. That reminds me, steel block as yeah. well, also yeah. non-negotiable. Um, not any slight to any other materials. Brass would be ideal. It's just too damn heavy. Um, yeah. and, and there are some lighter materials, but you'll notice, yes, silent springs. B big steel block. Steel block. It, you know, it's, it is interesting when you, again, but just by accident, you know, I, I, you look inside the back of much, much more affordable guitars. Yes. And they'll have a, almost like a one centimeter or even sometimes less thick than that. And it's obviously all cost, isn't it? Just sure. trying to reduce it. And you just go, yeah, that makes a difference to the sound. You know, it's, and it's quite noticeable. It does. Your strings have to anchor into mm. that thing. I mean, and again, just, you know, to underscore contact points mm. it really matters. Um, because, you know, manufacturing is so good now. I've said this numerous times, but we're in 2024 now, so I have to update the year. But it's 2024. Guitars are sick. They're all yeah. sick, right? Yeah. So it, it's just like... You have to try to win where you can, and these are the things that really, really mattered. So yeah, basswood body, roasted maple neck and fingerboard on this particular iteration. This is called Royal Sapphire. It also features the first matte finish as well, and then it also has my pickups. Well, that, that, so pickups are perfect. And I, I'm interested, again, we'll, we'll, we'll hear some of these. So obviously you've got HH on everything. Yes. Um, but you're a big fan of the coil split yes. kind of tone. Yes. And I, people who watch Anderson's will know that I, I sort of, I'm a, I'm, I like a single coil to be a single coil and a humbucker to be a humbucker. And the split thing always for me feels like a bit of a compromise. Sure. But I do accept some manufacturers are getting really close now to, you know, split humbuckers that you just can't tell the difference. Between yeah, I think there. it, well, I think where it matters is the amount of time and effort that you put into prioritizing that sound on the switch and mm. making sure that that's something that uh, isn't an afterthought. Mm. A lot of the time, you know, you'll develop a humbucking set and you'll think about meat and potatoes, but then, you know, there is there is a grayscale there along that five way. Some guys like a three way, that's fine. Um, but there are a lot of back catalog songs for like, for example, I was playing a tune called I'm Awake at the beginning there, um, which is, it's been a minute, um, but uh, that, that record in particular and that that song features a sound that is you know synonymous with this thing yeah. so I, I had to make sure that it, that it that it uh, was you know as 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 optimal as it can be um and yeah we might as well talk about pickups so to also underscore what makes these guitars really have bang for buck is Schecter usa custom shop pickups for a guitar at this price point. On a series is crazy. And it's that was great. another thing that, you yeah. know, that it was a, real, a very strong advantage with Schecter having such um, a great, um, you know, pickup arm of the custom shop. Um, so we spent quite a bit of time on this. This is my um, Solstice and Equinox set. And um, also happy to announce that they will be available um, outside of these instruments as well. That's all coming very soon. Awesome. So, but you get them when you, when you get these guitars. So, um, Carefully selected magnets, um, Alnico 8, Alnico 6, and it took a while to get there. I don't think I've ever heard of anything above Alnico 5. Right. So uh, 8 is becoming a little bit more common, um, I think. And what is the, as the number goes up, is this, this, does that mean just more output or is it just a different tonality? So pickups are, again, with this all being a learning experience, pickups are a bit of a voodoo. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I mean, the amount of guitars that have, you know, been through your hands and on your channel and stuff. Uh, even that's your reaction. So it speaks to like pickups just go over heads. Like yeah. it is, it is an art, an art, pardon me, an art form that I, re I respect highly, um, especially considering I don't wield a soldering iron. So it's, this takes uh, so long to figure out how these things work. I think there's a, the, 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 probably the, the, the pickup guys, the, you know, who make them here or Seymour Duncan or Larry DiMarzio, all that kind of stuff. I think they're, they're almost not unsung heroes, but it's like, that, that, you know, I mean, that, that makes a, that's, I mean, arguably, I guess the pickup that's on your electric guitar is probably the, the single most important element of its tone. It I'm not saying it's the only element of its tone, but no. it's, it's important. Um, really matters. So when it comes to the classification of the magnet, 
It's not about output because you can have a two or a four right. wound to a particular output. Oh, yes, of course, it's the wine. Wine. Yes. So yeah. right, and I thought the same thing. I, I literally was FaceTiming Mike Crandall mm. here in the custom shop and being like, "Dude, school me. Like, I don't <laughs> even understand what we're getting into." You know, we tried some early iterations and they weren't yielding exactly what we were looking for. And it's like, how do you even? quantify mm. that how do you describe that without being like the guy who is like i need more mm. i need more magenta it's like dude that's you got to figure out how to communicate these things so um do you, do you, are you a are you kind of like i know in this setup here and i should say by the way i had nothing to do with this being here it it i arrived and it was set up and ready to go there happens so, to be one in my yes, living room so. I, I was very happy to see us here but it's, it's not part of my personal ride all now, good wherever i go all good so um yeah, which was crazy as well. We're in, you know, we're in Schecter's uh, main place. It's nice yes. to see it here. But anyway. Love it. It's now, amazing. I know you're, uh, if you were touring, you'd have a, a, a Axe FX and a, and a more complex kind of rig. So, but I noticed when you were sort of setting up and playing, you were quite comfortable with this idea of a, almost like a, sta a single sound sure. from here, but then changing yeah. the vibe just from selecting a different position on the on the blade so I'm I sort of like what what is your you know is is that fundamentally where you're sort of happy or do you like to have almost like no I've got I'm gonna have like 50 different patches on my FM9 and, and yeah. every single one is going to be dialed in perfect yeah I'm that guy too um, both <laughs> matter okay um, and like we were talking about styles of guitar learning about amp topology as you you know work your way through you know, discovering what your sound is or how to get certain sounds, um, you 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 come to find which circuits take to these types of things. Um, I'll, I'll definitely uh, you know play some examples here and kind of show what we're describing with that. But um, you know, you'll learn early on. So my first tube amp was a real tube amp was a, a dual rectifier, mm -hmm. and I fought for ages to figure out how to get a sound. Oh, I like that amplifier, but is it just not... I mean, I suppose in fairness, I think of dual rectifier as, as probably a, a, a sort of a 90s yes, high gain. I knew you were going to say. You know, whereas maybe for you it doesn't work. It's just not tight enough. Is that the problem? <sighs> yeah, so, you know, I would see them um, with bands that... And we're talking... This is a long time ago, way pre-intervals. This is just me sort of in the infancy of, of learning about this stuff. Um, but I think it's worth mentioning because um, a lot of viewers probably have this journey with trying to decipher what amps do. You know, and it's funny that this is what we're using because off camera, one, what I said to you was like, this is like my favorite take on a, and I won't say what, but style of amplifier yeah. that does it almost in a more friendly and sweet and musical and inviting way. And I wouldn't know that unless I explored what mm. those circuits are or things like that. So with the rectifier, yeah, it's a little fluffy and a little tubby. Mm. And then I, I remember being at a show, seeing a, a band that's local to me, um, uh, actually the band that brought us to the United Kingdom and, and Europe and stuff for the first time, a band called Protest the Hero. Um, and I remember being um, still in high school at the time and just fighting my way to the front of this, a smaller gig, to just to get near Luke's pedal board and see what was going on. And I remember he had uh, the Zach Wilde overdrive. Oh, wow. And this is the first time I had ever seen anybody the Berserk, with the... the MXR thing? It was the or? MXR thing, yeah. the white one with the, yeah. with the, like, the, the target on it. Yeah. So I, this is the first time I had ever seen drive off level max. Right. And I'm, and I'm having this moment going, is this how guys are doing this? Like, I, you know, so these are the early days yeah. of trying to figure that out. And I just got off tour with one of my you know, favorite human beings, incredible guitar player, Wes Houck. He plays in Alluvial. Yeah. Um, he, you know, he's an Imanez guy. He's been in a number of bands. Um, Wes is just a, you know, one of those guys where uh, if, I, uh, if I need to kind of like figure something out or bounce something off, off, off somebody that I trust in the guitar space, He's that. He's that dude. So um, I love. I got. I only if I don't say it now, I'll forget. But I love the. We all did that. Fought to the front to see if we could see the pedal board settings of the guitarist. To, like. Yeah, and it's almost like the internet is just nobody. You, you know, because there's always someone that's posted a photograph. Oh, there's the a guy so, who has a whole page for yeah. just John Mayer's pedal exactly. boards. From very but I I used to love that. So, you know, and if it was a smaller gig or whatever, and quite often yeah. the band wouldn't mind if you just got up once they finished and you'd be like, sure. ah, this is the pedal he's got. Oh, I had no business being like, anywhere near these guys. Yeah. Come to be some of, our, you know, the best dudes that I know. We've probably yeah. done, you know, like 80 shows together, you know, toured around the world together. Um, but uh, no, so I started to see that. And then 
you know, I got like a max on or something, like yeah. an approximation of like whatever that thing is. Oh yeah, an overdrive, sure. Yeah. Uh, still not quite doing it. I still can't figure out how to dial it. And um, you know, I was, there's so many seminal records that back in, and th this is the time, but pre, you know, being able to just Google something mm -hmm. quickly and mm -hmm. figure out, maybe I'm showing my age. Um, uh, trying to figure out like what, how did you you know so there's so many albums where I would read or yeah. come to find out that it was a rectifier yeah and what you don't know is oh they got a, like an attenuator on it or they're doing all these tricks in the studio or this just happens to be a really good one you know there's a particular record um, by a band called Misery Signals like a you know hardcore band a band that I came up with a band that Intervals toured with in the early days they have an album called Controller um, I don't know if this is true or not the the lore is that Devin Townsend made this record. I shouldn't okay. Wikipedia that. I don't actually know whether or not that's the case. He might have only re recorded the vocals. He could have done the guitars. Anyway, best rectifier sound I've ever heard. And to me, I'm like, how do you get there? And then I would fight and fight and fight with my gear and not be able to get there. So we've taken a tangent, but all of that is to say it matters at the source. Yes. But it also absolutely matters when you're trying to have this wide palette of sounds. Um, to understand how to get them. So if I want a really thick and saturated bridge pickup sound that does the modern metal thing, and a lot of people will think 5150 or something, mm -hmm. well, that amp becomes what I consider to be like a pillow or mushy when you split. Right. So you go for something like a Plexi or an 800 or perhaps something like this, which is you know right in that sweet spot where this is just gain one, two. So this is just yeah. crunch, but actually yeah. this is a good place to be because it's quite transparent. Like you can hear the grind in that pickup and you can hear, you know, the character of the basswood and the maple and how I'm hitting it is all coming through. Tons of clarity. Yes. Now one flick of the switch. And that's got this like hyper strat on steroids yeah. thing. Now a lot of a lot of dual humbucking pickups can fall apart there. So this is where you have to take that time. And that's your split, sorry, that's your split bridge, isn't it? Which you'd normally- No, this is, this is inner coils. So I'm, ah, I'm, so sorry. I'm not okay. a fan of tapped humbuckers. So when, when right. you were describing this early yeah. on, I'm with you. Yeah. I, I don't believe that when you engineer a humbucker to have this optimal output, that when you tap it to yeah. one coil, it was never really designed to do yeah. that. It's a bit anemic, the noise floor comes up. Now you're gonna get noise increase on a split sound. Yeah. However, uh, it would have been the early JPs where I discovered yeah. like, what is going on in that center position? It, John uses a three way to do it um, and a very particular switch to achieve that sound. But um, over the course of time I discovered, okay, no, five ways how you do it, you do yeah. it on position two. So you, you don't have any single single coils on their no. own. They're, it's either the two inner coils or the two outer coils. So we go bridge full, yeah. inner coils, both pickups, yeah. outer coils, yeah. and then full neck. I think, don't we have PRS to thank for that? Isn't that basically how the original Custom 24s, that was their two humbuckers, but that was their five-way on the rotary switch. And to take it further, when um, in my days of playing those guitars, I really liked the, I believe it was called the 504? Right, yeah. So it had the um, narrow range um, yeah. humbucker in the neck. And it had all those switches where you could then decide, yeah. like, you know, if this one's single, etc. Yeah. yeah, I really liked that, but it was a little too much because for me, um, I've gotten really used to this, like, yeah. flicking the switch and landing in position two. And uh, I could easily get away with a three way to do this, but in the studio, there is a range of sounds that you can get on three and four. And I kind of feel like I'm missing it by not having it. There's also a muscle memory to just landing on two. Um, so t I, I tec technically, I, I live between one, two, and five. Um, but just to kind of show. So that's just a killer bridge pickup all yeah. by its lonesome. The, we're not helping the amp at all. This is just a well-dialed bridge pickup in the output range that I like mm -hmm. uh, that just hits the amp in a way that's really great. And the Alnico 8, I would describe as, like my bridge pickup reads like a, a muscular PAF. Not to say that PAF isn't a muscular pickup, but there's just like a little more umph under the hood where it has that upper mid-range cut I like from a PAF. Yeah. Um, especially when you put it in a bolt-on guitar like this, there is like some serious snap. Um, especially even in, even in the bridge position, um, can really hear how I'm picking. Um, but then when you go here, 
there's just this beautiful thing that happens when you introduce yeah. the coil from the neck. And then the neck, um, all by its lonesome. <laughs> Just a sweet, kind of creamy kind of thing. And, you know, oh, the- like Nice and bluesy. The uh, this is like, you know. Get down with some stuff. Yeah, yeah man, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the thing. Intervals is a very strange sort of concoction of, of many influences, um, you know. Um, definitely came up on a lot of different sounds. We just happened to present it in a way that's like on 11 most times. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, all of that is to say we spent a lot of time carefully selecting magnets that um, I found achieve like, you know, I mean, if that's the reaction I get, then I, I think that's great because that's what that sound is designed to, to read like. Um, but guitars and guitarists, like we're superficial. Like there's a whole feel element here that doesn't translate there mm -hmm. to the viewer or, or even to you sitting here in the room. We, you know, oftentimes, um, and I learned this a lot from being on tour with Tosin, um, in, in spring 2022, he was prototyping the Kaizen mm -hmm. and I was working on my pickups as well. We would use the looper um, on his rig at Soundcheck and we would just both like play a loop in or he would just hand me both guitars or whatever, play the same thing in. And then we would just like mix them up on the switcher and walk away and then just like be like, you know, which which is the one? And I caught him choosing my pickups sometimes and vice versa, I would choose his, you know. So a lot of the time, um, you have to stop touching the instrument to walk away and ask yourself what the listener's hearing. But there is this superficial thing that I always try to like discredit mm. it. Like, no, that's like me being too selfish. Uh, but field matters because like I have to drive the bus. Like I have to be, you know. I, I, that's my, I, I've sort of, you hear it all the time in the comments section on the YouTube. Oh, well the audience would never hear that. So what's the point, you know? Mm. And it's the sort of, it's the stock response to almost, oh yeah, I bought this expensive such and such. And then the audience is like, but the, audi but the audience would never hear that. So what's the point? It matters. And I, I think really I've got to the point now where I accept me sitting here and listening to you or seeing an interval a gig or a record or whatever, I'm, oh, I'm just hearing you. Yeah. That, you know, I'm hearing the sum of everything, sure. but really I'm just hearing you. And the difference between you at your best mm. and you at your second best or <laughs> worst or whatever, you know, whatever, sure. however, is it's a very personal thing just for you. Yes. So it, it, it almost matters. matters nothing about if if a, if a certain cable brand is the if a certain power supply brand is the one that you go that's what I needed that yeah because then that elevates your you output know, yeah that that's what the audience hears the audience hears when you're at your best exactly and what it is that creates that is it doesn't it's irrelevant exactly it's uh, to every to anyone other than just you. Yeah, it's so for sure. So again, I, I mean, there probably are extremes where you can go, some people say, well, look, I can hear the difference between when Jimmy Page is playing a Les Paul versus a Telecaster. Okay, fine, you know, does it, does it really matter? But you, you know, yeah, you, what you wanna hear on an album or a gig is the artist at their best. At their best, 100%. And uh, that's why we, you know, we took the time to, mm -hmm. to do that. They, they indulged me to do so as well. Um, I certainly, an, unorthodox combination of magnets we achieved a set of pickups that no matter what instrument I have them in you know I have them in a range of, of guitars that are all sort of relatively related but I, like I said I have some Schecter Custom Shop strats where I've dropped my bridge pickup in alongside some singles and it just works you know because we've taken the time to craft something that yeah makes me feel comfortable but also like variety and versatility matters to me um, I'm a little spooked sometimes by things that are very you know my music is niche, but I don't want the gear to be, so. We should, we should probably, um, I'm just a little bit conscious of the fact we've got uh, a, a finite amount of time here sure. and we've got some more guitars. Let's do it. So yeah, let's have a little listen here. Everything you heard there, I think, was just on the, on the crunch channel yeah. of the amplifier. So maybe we'll find some of the higher gain Six settings or seven. as well. Oh, everyone wants to see that seven, but we're yeah. leaving a mystery. Oh, he says do seven. Okay, let's do it. Do you know what? Give me the six. At least I can yeah. hold it. I won't Let's play do it. that. 
All right, so. So, right, so these are American made. Yes. Now, again, I can't, these are to be released? Very soon. Very soon. Like super soon. Super soon. That's why I'm here, in fact, is to, uh, is to kind of get all the nomenclature and the promo together for these, which is, you know, an extension of, we, we achieved what we set out to do in the Diamond Series, and now we have the, this is the, the USA line, which has some, some differences for sure. I always like the, the Schecter thing where they, uh, engrave the artist's name into the back. It always looks cool. I must it? say I'm fairly partial. Yeah. So, um, let, so let's go over the differences yeah, then. Because sure. I mean, there's some, there's some obvious differences and there's yeah. some more subtle differences. For but, sure. You know. So the, the, I think the most obvious one would be that the first iteration of the, my guitars with Schecter in the Diamond Series were based on that carved top like mm -hmm. we were talking about. And I've actually since kind of uh, let that go. Um, sort of in a quest to make the instrument feel just that touch more sleek and close mm -hmm. to the body and streamlined. Um, what you'll notice though is like, if you see the guitar head on, it looks like, you know, a, a silhouette that you're very familiar with. But if you look down the Ooh. butt of the instrument, you'll notice that oh, yeah. teardrop sort of radius which is a very subtle feature that I feel like a lot of people are gonna be excited about when they finally get one in hand or they sit down with the does instrument. It, does it go from like a heavier radius here to here or is that just it's like all a, It's all, I think there's some trickery happening with yeah, the way the horns are. Illusion. Yeah, so um, it's not unlike something that Schechter has sort of already been doing. We sort of borrowed that detail from a guitar that I'm also fond of in, in their catalog. Um, but we went for more of a bit of a classic silhouette um, and yeah, as a result, it makes for a guitar that is like really sleek and close to the body um, and just looks timeless. Um, this is a silhouette that I'm really excited to iterate on. Like I said, we started with lightweight older bodies, um, monochromatic um, color palette to begin with, roasted maple fingerboard and neck, and truly one piece quarter sawn um, necks, which, you know, so we had to sort of sacrifice the headstock, but we went in a direction that makes these just bonafide. Like, these are my favorite necks I've ever played. Um, the shape is incredible. Um, the way they finish them is amazing. Mm. Fretwork, immaculate. I mean, I don't have to say much about the reputation of the Schecter US Custom Shop. These are the OGs. It's, this is a feature, I think, this Cortisone kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They must have known back in the original origins of guitar because this is a this is a this is a way of cutting the neck that not only makes it stronger and less likely to move but also has this kind of tone transference so it's easier for the vibrations to kind of travel through yes. the neck and then into the body and therefore into the pickups yes. but it's just like it's such a it's really important and i i think that the some of the issues here is it's not the most um cost-effective way of cutting wood. So it's not the way that gets the most necks from a piece of wood. But in my opinion, but, it creates a reliable heirloom instrument forever. Yeah, but that's what I mean. So it, that's, people go, so why is this guitar more expensive than this guitar? And it's little things like, yeah, if you, if you can take a piece of wood and get 20 necks out of it, as opposed to six necks out of it or whatever, then obviously you drive the cost down. But this is, yes. this is, this is about doing everything the best rather yes. than Hundred you know, percent. Trying to hit a price point, and still some carbon fiber in there as well. Even though with a roasted neck, like, that's just like an insurance policy. It really doesn't even sort of matter at that point. But sixteen-inch uh, fingerboard radius non-compound on this tall stainless fret, uh, lumen lay, of course. Other notable things to to mention outside of obviously the pickups um, would be these custom tuning heads, which are sort of utilitarian and tactile and. Just a can, different can aesthetic. I, can I ask one before? I do want to ask the radius sure. question sure. before we get on this. Sure. Uh, do you do you bend the strings a lot, or are you predominantly sort of a legato style? I'm not like I'm not like you know reefing on stuff. Like full step bends are are, are quite, kind of rare in my vocabulary. Half step bends, more so right. the ability to get under the string and express. It's more about the vibrato. It's more about that. 
being able to get yeah. under that tall fret and not have to fight it. There's a thing that happens with a compound radius that I, again, the guitar is all about, it's a game of, of compromise, right? Yeah. So while it's friendly and inviting for chords, I find that I'm always having to adjust my feel um, with each string and the tension, and it's almost like more to mm -hmm. ingrain into the muscle memory. There's more to remember um, about, you know, your best friend yeah. um, versus, uh, you know, uh, if this one asks me when it's birthday, as I'm, I'm more inclined to remember its name and its birthday. So, you know, it's, it's just, it's just a, for a more reliable handshake. Um, also, from a radius standpoint, at the bridge, if you take a radius gauge and you go to set the instrument up, yeah. 16 is 16 all the way across, and there's no negotiating whether or not, oh, well, there's some compromise in the 12 range because we set it for 16. Right. So for me, my OCD is just like... I've never thought about that, but it's a good point if you've got it, you know, because, yeah, how yeah. do you set a bridge if it's not, if it's a compound radius? Well, good text will just make an just, approximation yeah, based it, on feel or, you know, some, maybe if it's 12 to 16, you set it for 14. I'm not really sure what, what the, the logic is there. All I know is these instruments just set up and play unbelievably they are crazy, so crazy buttery. low action isn't it it's like yeah i could even go a little bit lower to be well honest, no that's but. what i'm sure it probably could but it does feel <laughs> like it doesn't i mean that that's There's always no my yeah so and i think the fight thing is always really interesting because you you can listen to some guitar players stevie ray whatever like that jack white it's all about yeah yeah all that's the, the fight. it's all about the fight and i think with me as as well i do I find if I'm bending strings, and a lot of my playing style is is bending strings. Okay. I like that. I like that slightly higher uh, radius. That slightly, sorry, more curved. So like rounder. a rounder, like a rounder. Okay, interesting. We're, and 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 I'll sacrifice that action. I'll just go with that slightly higher wow. action to, to to play. But I, I think some of it is. I'm not sure. I would use the. I don't feel like I'm fighting with the instrument, but I don't. I equally. Um, I, I like to know that there's a string under my fingers. You know? Okay. Yeah, I think it really just kind of depends on, on the it's vocabulary. The style, isn't it? it's, the, it's the style of the Yeah, that... there's some, some stuff going on with like. Um... Hybrid picking and wide intervallic spacing and stuff. I need to I need to be able to I, uh, sort of oscillate from that to things that are more vocal. And then also sound really homogenous and very mm. glued and tight as well. So for me, it's it's just about having something that is kind of like I, I think sixteen is kind of that middle ground for me. Twenty feels too flat. Twelve and fourteen. You know, we we actually played around in an early version of this guitar that had a fourteen inch radius, and mm -hmm. it still just kind of like wasn't there. So we decided let's go let's go sixteen, and then all of a sudden things really started to start, kind of come in focus. So yeah, that's uh, I mean probably the most I've ever spent on radius. But let's that's get nerdy. It. No 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 worries. So well, that's I mean, it. Well, let, so let's talk about these because yeah. this is. I, when I first saw these, I I said to you, "So wow, what what brand are these?" And it's like, "But you've made these." Yeah, these are these are crazy. Yeah, these are custom for for this model. So I wanted to do something that would, you know, again, I, I, not that it matters. Like the peanut gallery in the comment section doesn't ever, you know, sway these types of things. These are guitars that are ultimately for me. If anyone else wants them, that's a bonus. Um, but I did want something that sets it apart. And there's a symmetry to the look of that tuner on that headstock that I really kind of dig where you don't have this, not that, you know, that, that tuning keys are, are messy to, mm. to a degree. Um, Did you get it from the, the Kaizen then? As in, because obviously Tosin has- They're different. The, but he, yes, yeah, so he's are gone- hidden on the back. Yeah, he's gone with it. It is a, it's a, I know it's a different system, but yep. it's that, the similarity I suppose is, is that sort of knurled round tuner that you would I actually think the first time I saw anything like it was on um Nolly collaborated with a guitar uh, with Manson called okay. the the Oryx or the one. Onyx okay. yeah um which is a, it, yeah it flew under the radar that's interesting um it, funny enough on a tilt back reverse headstock and they were along the bottom and I saw them floating along the bottom and I was like ooh, ooh. I like that but ooh. we wanted to put our own kind of spin on it and um we had these developed Actually, the size and shape of these is specifically to be friendly with the size and shape of the yes. headstock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, uh, you know, funny enough, the Keith Marrow guitar has the the thinner, more spindly, taller ones, the, the USA, the KM um, USA guitar. Um, and there are some Abbasis as well, um, which are guitars that I, I love. I have a few in my mm -hmm. collection. Um, 
that have that tuner as a, a hip shop will produce them in their own shape. But we decided that, yeah, we wanted to do our own. So Drew um, here at the Schechter uh, Custom Shop actually 3D printed the prototypes. Wow. And we settled on a shape and a size that we thought actually just really complements this headstock. And I just love how, yeah, utilitarian it is. And um, I sort of mentioned to you off camera that like mm -hmm. the idea for me personally is as I'm like kibitzing with the crowd and doing banter and stuff, that I can very quickly navigate through without having to negotiate where the tuning head is and just has a really good satisfying feel. Like tuning's annoying, it might as well be like fun to it, do. It fit, I mean, I know it's a standard uh, hip shot tuner. Yeah, basically. and they, we should but say it, that they are hip shot tuners, it yeah. Feels, it feels like you have slightly more control yes. over the gear ratio, yes. doesn't it, like this? And yes. it's a bit weird. Yeah, it's a weird... I mean, I, again, I think any good set of tuners, you, you know, if you have crappy tuners, that's where you kind of like, uh, you, you twist it, you go, no, oh, it doesn't seem to be making much difference. Exactly. And then it, like, it'll all come... <laughs> Yeah. And I'm not suggesting, you know, if you have good traditional tuners, you won't have that problem. No. But there is, this does sort of feel a bit like, if you're just trying to do that last micro cent of a tune, that the, there's just a slightly more ergonomically yeah. nicer way of, it's clever. It's amazing. Um, clever. There are no um, string winders that will fit on those heads, so uh, tax oh, yeah, everywhere. Yeah, that's true. You're not going to be able to do the super fast yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tax everywhere are going to be making voodoo dolls out of me for but sure. But I think, and again, you said this before as well, because it's a locking, um, a locking system. Yes. You, you've only got to get maximum half a turn. No, I just restrung these before to, I flew yeah. out the other day, and I was just like hanging out, I had them on the kitchen table, and it was just like. You know, I was like, I've heard my tech say that, and I'm like, how bad can it be? It's not bad at all. And actually, I've seen uh, uh, this move, this like wax on, wax off move that you can kind of do with them uh, if you want to get them all going yeah. at the same time. You know, if you say you're doing a full restrict, they're really fun. They're very inviting. It's, it's beautifully fretted. Oh, it's I, absolutely I, I incredible. Think, These necks are amazing. I think great fret work is something you should never underestimate on a guitar you know it's just like again it's contact those, points mm. this matters you know and especially for playability your ability to I, express i like how on nice guitars where they get that sort of bull nose end on the on the fret end you know so it's, uh, it's i don't know it's just uh, they beautiful Schechter USA Just Custom Shop. Properly what, nerding out about lots of silly things on guitars. Now. What is there to say about that? You know, and, mm. and really at the end of the day, all the, 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 the core features that exist in the Diamond series are here as well. Uh, there is an aesthetic difference with yeah, the neck like plate. You know, joint, there aren't it? just full, four bolts here. We, we did um, you know, utilize the intervals insignia here, which is really cool and uh, just a, a nice kind of custom touch. But aside from that, yeah, lightweight older bodies, um, the, the seven string is 26.5, uh, just to get a little bit more of that. It'll really make what's that the, hit. What's the, I can see something in here. Uh, this the... guitar, so this guitar has a block behind it. It's in drop C. For some of the back catalog material, I tend to just uh, lock the trim down oh, in, in lieu see. of a fixed bridge six, which I'm sure will happen. But. So have you, so you've gone old, cause this, this is my sort of Eric Clapton oh, old school, there. just basically a bit of wood whacked in there to stop that. Yeah. See, Piece of mahogany. even though he's modern, he's still basically going back. <laughs> it's like, he's just stealing the, the Eric Clapton way of locking a trim yeah. system off. And then this one's in drop D and it's got the uh, trim on it and it's wide open. Um, the guitars will also come with silent springs. That's another thing to mention as well. I don't like the idea of gunking up the cavity um, with a bunch of, you know, like foam or like mm -hmm. a tissue or whatever to wrap What's the springs. What's a silent spring? Well, other than obviously a silent spring is a silent spring, but I've never even heard it. So, the, the, I mean, I, again, you're talking about, so when you're doing that, you can sometimes hear the creak of the, of the spring, can't you? You're saying that these are specially so done to be that's silent. part of it, but actually it's more so about, I'm holding a fixed bridge guitar that's string through, so it doesn't matter, but yeah. it's actually more, um, it's, it's the oh, equivalent the of this. It's yeah, sympathetic yeah, yeah. resonance okay. inside the cavity when it comes to that sound. I didn't even know there was such a thing as a silent spring. I think we've got one near Guildford. It's like a nice to walk your dog around <laughs> on a sort of a Sunday afternoon, but it's a different kind of silent spring, I think, that one. Yeah, but, um, yeah. only mimes walk their dogs at the silent <laughs> spring. Yeah, got it, yeah. yeah. No, honestly, we genuinely have, and the story goes, that like hundreds of years ago, a girl drowned in the thing, and it's and, the, and now there's no ripples on the on the water, and it's called silent. Actually, I think it's called Silent Pool rather than Silent Spring. But there you go. Throw that one in there for the Guildford Tourist Board. Wow. Very nice place to go and walk. <laughs> You'll uh, show me when I come to Guildford. Yeah, that? absolutely. That's crazy. Um, um, yeah. So no, that's totally a thing. Um, you know. Uh, 
a lot of people ask about the fret rap. I'm not the I'm not pulling it down and using it to you know in studio. Yeah, it's great. It beats yeah. wrapping a sock around the instrument. I'll, I'll use it for to clean certain things up. But really, at the end of the day. Um, it's about sympathetic resonance. So I'm just trying to keep those, yeah. you know, those palm mutes and those start stops and any quick rests yeah. real tight. Yeah. You know? And then, yeah, there's some spring talk, like sometimes for certain things or whatever. But yeah, no, a silent spring is just, uh, it's got some like foam on the inside. Oh, cool. And they're typically made from a, like a black material that just, yeah, it's just nice, nice and quiet. So streamlined, really um, straight ahead. Minimal, um, but again, the idea is to start pure here and iterate. I mean, picture this guitar with a figured top and a natural mahogany mm. back and an ebony fingerboard and some flamey goodness. I mean, it's all it's all coming, you know? I just wanted to start here. You cannot mess up a lightweight alder body mm. with a roasted maple neck and board, bolt-on construction. It sounds and feels like that strap from mm -hmm. way back that I love, but it reads like a thing that looks good on a strap on me and on anybody else. And just there's a color palette that speaks to me as well. These are just some choice Pantones that I sort of tweaked a little bit, um, gave some references to Chewy in the custom shop. He's amazing. This one's called Sugar Coral. That one's called Pale Emerald. And you know, these are coming soon. So. We, 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 we better play out and finish up now. But All right. Hopefully, uh, Aaron is going to come to, uh, well, next time he's in the UK, is um, spend, come and visit Anderton's, and hopefully we'll get a bit more time to, to talk and uh, maybe do a masterclass in the evening. We'll have to we'll see what we can put together. It'd be, be really, really cool if we could. But play us out. We'll, you know, I'll put links to all these guitars uh, in the description below. Yep. Uh, or as much as we know about them at the time this video goes out. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, definitely, definitely the, the Diamond series. You'll yeah, we should in, mention in this is most, available now. Yeah, and, and you'll see that, I'm sure, in most Schecter retailers. Obviously, the USA ones will be a little bit harder to track down, but... They're worth, coming. I would... I would take, you know, I would try and track them down. It's a, it is a beautiful looking guitar. Yeah, yep, production is underway. That's why I'm here is to be able to tell everybody in detail from Schecter's platforms about yeah. it. And uh, yeah, there's uh, not much more mystery anymore. So this is the, actually, this is the first time I've been given a platform to talk about it. So I appreciate it. Oh, brilliant. I'm super pleased we could do that. So, okay. well, look, thanks so much for spending the time with us. Of course. Thank you guys for tuning in and, you know, take it away. I'll just make a little bit of random racket and yeah. You happy on that sound still or you yeah. want it? Okay. Uh, uh, actually give me a little more gain. Why not? Let's go on gain the... two.